So we seem to hear more every day about how these ultra processed foods are really not good for us and we really should be eating more real food sources in our diet. And most people's point of view is just like, oh man, I, I really hear these aren't very good for me and toaster pastries and donuts and potato chips. I, I probably really ought to eat an apple tomorrow. Oh man. But the viewpoint shouldn't just be, oh, these really aren't very good for me. You really want to understand what these things are doing to our bodies. This is going to freak you out. TC Hill is not a doctor and does not claim to be a doctor or licensed in any type of medical field. Don't be an idiot and use anything heard on the show as medical advice. This information should be used for educational purposes only and you should contact your doctor for any medical advice. Now get off me. Now remember, I'm not a doctor. I'm not giving anybody nutritional advice here. I'm just a guy like you who understands how to research things. And in today's world, it's becoming more and more apparent that people around the world are improving a wide variety of health issues by just removing some processed junk from their diet, eating more real foods. So if we're going to look into the effects of these ultra processed foods, we first need to understand what does that even mean? And when we're looking at ultra processed foods, we're looking at something that was made in a factory. It's usually going to go into a package too, but it's, it didn't grow out of the ground. It didn't come from an animal. It didn't fall from a tree. This was something that was created. And you can usually see it by all the additives that they have. And we're usually going to be looking at things like preservatives. We hear preservatives a lot and that makes sense. Oh, we got to make it stay on the shelf longer, but it's a lot about flavor enhancers. And a lot of times that has to do with sweeteners as too, trying to make these foods more palatable, more delicious. You can't just eat one. They want you to want to buy more. So they're going to put a lot of flavor enhancers in there. Emulsifiers and colorants. And these are the most common things. They can put some other stuff in there that might throw a few loops and to what your body might be doing. But this is what we're really looking at. And we're looking at this happening because of the shelf life and because the dollars are involved. And when you can use these chemicals, you can produce what's considered a food much cheaper than you would if you were going to create an actual food. And a lot of the scientists that work for these food manufacturing companies are some of the best scientists in the world because they pay the best. Why wouldn't the brightest, smartest scientists want to make the most money? That's might be why they went and studied all that stuff so that they could create a good living for themselves. So they might go towards the companies that are paying the most. Well, a lot of cases, it's these food manufacturers. So they come up with some brilliant scientists that understand how to make things stay longer on the shelf, how to create something that looks like food, tastes like food, but is much cheaper to produce than food. So the benefit in their mind is that, well, we're helping people too. We're lowering the costs of what they have to spend on their food. The problem is when you look at this country, we spend less on food than just about any other country, but we also spend more on our health care than just about any other country. So don't view that as an accident. Understand what's going on. We also look at this as going on because of the aggressive marketing that goes on with these types of foods, especially towards children. They're really marketing towards children a lot. And when you dig into these business meetings, you see that that's what their goal is. Well, if we market to the kids, the kids are going to get their parents to buy this junk and it's all going to work out great. But you're going to see these things most commonly in like sugary drinks and snack type foods, uh, frozen meals like dinners and things like that. And then all of the sweetened cereals. That's really where you're going to see the majority of these things and you can find them pretty much anywhere. But this is the things that are the biggest offenders, the biggest money makers and seem to be creating the most trouble. So to understand that the problems that this is creating is not just woo woo type of information that you might hear on the on the block. We look at this study here on ultra processed food exposure and adverse health outcomes an umbrella review of epidemiological meta-analysis. And their conclusion is that greater exposure to ultra processed food was associated with a higher risk of adverse health outcomes, especially cardiometabolic, common mental disorder, and mortality outcomes. So we're looking at some significant health issues that appear to be associated with consuming more ultra processed foods. 
And a great way to understand what ultra processed foods are is when you just look at the ingredients and you look at all these words that you don't even know what they mean. What is a hepso, hopso, capso, roxolide? I don't even know what that is. If you don't know what it is, don't eat it. Now, some of the biggest offenders that we do understand are high fructose corn syrup, hydrogenated oils, and then all these ingredients with really long lists. Like you look at the ingredients like, wow, that's longer than the last book that I read. And a really big problem is a lot of the dyes that go into these foods. We look at this study here, um, toxicology of food dyes. And I'm going to post a link to these studies in the description below this video so you can dig into this a little bit more. But when they're looking at food dyes, they just talk about these different dyes that have been found to um, you know, have carcinogens. And these studies show toxicity tests on these dyes. But they came to a great conclusion that I wanted to share here. And they say the inadequacy of much of the testing and the evidence of carcinogenicity, genotoxicity, and hypersensitivity, coupled with the fact that these dyes do not improve the safety or nutritional quality of foods, indicates that all of the currently used dyes should be removed from the food supply and replaced, if at all, by safer colorings. It is recommended that regulatory authorities require better and independent toxicity testing, exercise greater caution regarding continued approval of these dyes, and in the future approve only well-tested safe dyes. So what's interesting when we're looking at these type of food dyes and some of these ingredients that are really problematic, it's important for us to understand that when we look at the governments in other countries and regulatory situations in other countries, they don't allow all this garbage. There are a lot of ingredients that are banned in other countries that we still allow in our country. So you look at these huge manufacturers and you look at any name that you know. Pick any cereal that you loved as a kid and look up the ingredients of that cereal in another country. It's going to blow your mind. They use things like watermelon or carrot juice, things like that to color it instead of 40, 60, 60, number five, dye red, bleedy, bleedy. It's, it's insane. So we need to understand that we are being abused by the companies that are formed in this country. They're not taking care of their own people in the country. Other countries demand that they make those products more safe, more healthy, and they say, okay, yeah, we'll do that. It costs us a little bit more, but we'll do it. But since we don't demand it, we get all the junk. If you start researching high fructose corn syrup and you understand that this is very cheap to make and it sweetens things with a much smaller amount of ingredient and it's just a more powerful sweetener is really what it is. And it's very cheap and it's very cheap to grow and to make. And so this has gone into everything now. But when you start to research the trouble that high fructose corn syrup can create, uh, it'll, it's going to freak you out just a little bit. So when you can just avoid some of these things, you might be doing a big favor to yourself. But when we want to look at the impacts that these foods and ingredients are having on our bodies, we need to understand that there, there's a big deal with our metabolic health. And a lot of the studies that I'll link below dig into that and help you understand a lot about this type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance and obesity is all pointing to a lot of these things in these ultra processed foods. And I'll also link a study where they really lined up, okay, we're going to look, we're going to try and do some diets that are really the same. We're going to use the same macros, the same amount of sugar, the same amount of fiber in these two different diets. And one is going to be ultra processed and one is just going to be food. And the people in the just food that were eating the same amount of, you know, macronutrients and everything didn't gain weight like the ones in the ultra processed food. So this information is out there. It's been proven that this is some garbage that we're really eating, but we're not really looking at what it's doing to our body. We also have to understand toxicity in the body because we sort of view it like, oh, well, I ate that and then I didn't die. So I'm kind of okay. But when we're putting things in the body that the body does not recognize, the body doesn't recognize things that are synthetic. To the body, anything that is synthetic is considered a toxin because it's not natural. It's not supposed to be in there. The body has to view that like, well, if I can't use this, I need to figure out how to get rid of it. So a lot of these synthetic ingredients are just, they act like a toxin in the body. And when the body can't deal with a heavy toxic load, it can cram some of this stuff in fat cells. And then these fat cells expand and then our pants don't fit. And then all the trouble that comes with that weight gain is following in this cascade of trouble that can come on. Another thing we need to understand that can be a really big deal 
is digestive issues that come from all of these ultra processed foods. And anybody that knows me knows that that's what I'm gonna be most offended about. And when we look at this study here on ultra processed foods and food additives in gut health and disease, they say ultra processed foods or UPFs, like all the cool kids call them, and food additives have become ubiquitous components of the modern human diet. They say there is increasing evidence of an association between diets rich in UPFs and gut disease, including inflammatory bowel disease, colorectal cancer, and irritable bowel syndrome. Food additives are added to many UPFs and have themselves been shown to affect gut health. For example, evidence shows some emulsifiers, sweeteners, colors, and microparticles and nanoparticles have effects on a range of outcomes, including the gut microbiome, intestinal permeability, and intestinal inflammation. So when we're looking at things like you know, intestinal permeability, that can be a very big deal. Once that intestinal lining becomes too permeable, then a lot of these things start getting into the bloodstream that don't really belong there. And some of those are foods that haven't been broken down yet, and now our body's gonna start going to war against this food. We create these food sensitivity issues or autoimmune issues. So some of these factors are a really big deal. And when we're looking at things that have to do with digestion, I'll put a link in the description below this video for our video on is this how grains can affect bile flow and pancreatic function. And in that video, I go over some studies that help us understand that like wheat germ agglutinin that's found in wheat and a lot of other grains has the ability to block cholecystokinin, which kind of triggers our gallbladder and our pancreas to do their jobs. So all of a sudden the gallbladder is not working correctly and the pancreas is not working correctly and we're not really digesting our food. Plus we're creating all these other health issues like pancreatitis and you know gallstone disease and all these problems that can come about but we're not even thinking about all the factors that come when we're not really breaking down our food. When we're not breaking down our food, we're not accessing the nutrients in the foods that we're eating, which means our body's not getting all the nutrients it needs to run all the functions it runs. We know that nutrient deficiencies create a lot of trouble, so we need to understand that things that are creating digestive trouble, whether it's grains creating problems for that gallbladder and the pancreas to work correctly, or some of these other things that that study was talking about, creating issues like inflammation, or problems with the microbiome and all that good gut flora that helps us break down our food and get more nutrients out of it. It also helps our immune system. There's a lot of cascades that can be coming along when you start to create trouble with the digestive system. We also see some of these studies talking a lot about mental health issues and how they've seen that when you can remove some of these ultra processed foods, it has the ability to create some improvements to a wide variety of mental health issues. And we have a lot of videos on mental health where we talk about this type of stuff as well if you need to dig into that too. And it's my opinion that this is happening a lot with our kids, with this mental health stuff and this behavioral stuff. A lot of this has to do with the stuff that we're shoving in their gullet. Kids are jerks now. Have you seen them? Have you been to a birthday party? They're horrible. Well, I don't think it's really the kid's fault. I think it's because what we're feeding them and the reactions that's creating with their physiology. We also need to think about all the unknowns. Like we're pretty much part of the biggest science experiment that's ever been put together. Just because we don't understand all the things that a lot of these chemicals are going to do long term. We're just starting to get a grip on, oh, I don't think this is a good idea. We probably shouldn't be doing this so much. This is kind of new to the whole mainstream world. You know, we've been talking about eating real food for so long that I often forget that everybody doesn't know this, but it's really a small percentage of the population that understands that all this processed junk can create a whole lot of trouble. But what we need to think about is the fact that we're suckers. We're doing this to ourselves. We are voting with our dollars. The manufacturers have changed what they're doing in other countries because the other countries demanded it. So every time we buy this junk, we're letting them know, yeah, go ahead, just keep giving us toxins, keep giving our kids things that are gonna create problems for them down the road, please take my money. So what we really need to do is when we go to the store and we pick up a product and we read the ingredients and we have no idea what it's saying, we need to set the product back down. If the kid in the shopping cart is screaming that they really want it, we just need to be the adult. We just need to help them find something out. 
more and more manufacturers are coming out every day that are creating better versions of this. And that doesn't mean that all of these products are healthy or good for us. It might have the ability to still push a person the wrong way metabolically, but we're removing a lot of the toxic aspects by just using more natural ingredients. And some people just need to put a few more things in their favor. So the problem with all of this is that making the change to eating real food can be a little bit overwhelming. It's not always so easy just to start on Tuesday. Some people might need to take little steps. So if you need to take little steps, just start seeing, okay, I'm gonna eat this, this meal is gonna be just real food. And maybe then tomorrow I'll have two meals that are real food. And just start finding things that you can incorporate into your day that are not in a vending machine. When you can do that, the transition becomes a whole lot easier. Now, if you need help making this happen, you can jump over right now and check out our video on how to transition to a real food diet. I hope this helps.